it's the greeting of the season. May our names be found in the Lamb's Book of Life. The rehearsal of the Day of Atonement to be taken seriously every year is that we want to come by the grace of Yah, by the precious blood of Yeshua, to the sunset on the Day of Atonement with nothing between our souls and the Savior. So that is the, the, the calling for this day especially. And um, our first song is going to be Humble Thyself in the Sight of Yahweh. And so I'd like to ask the song leaders to come up. Thank you all for that. <clears throat> Yvonne, can we put you over here with a mic so that the internet folks can enjoy it too? Is that mic supposed to be on the piano? Yeah, but okay. put it on her oh, right now. Her, her, her wait, wait. violin. Can't I be closer and then you can, you can hear your piano? It's, th this will get the piano. is going to be feast day rehearsals. We like to sing through all of them from the spring all the way through to the fall. And this is the uh, middle of the fall feast with the Day of Atonement being today. But let's sing through all of them.
<clears throat> Our next song is going to be Teach Me Thy Way, Oh Yah. And this definitely relates to the sanctuary. As the Bible says, Thy way, O oh Yah, is in the sanctuary. <clears throat> Today we're going to be studying about atonement written in the stars. We know that for the first 2,000 years after the fall of man, that there were no scriptures written on paper, that they were written in the Maseroth. And before we begin, we're looking forward to a special music number with Sharana and Virginia on atonement.
I'm going to start us off with prayer. Apologies, I was muted there. And um, at the conclusion of my prayer, I'm asking that Mark would blow the shofar. We have had a little shofar blast in the room when we had our prayer time, but we want to be able to bless those of you joining online. And the shofar is a form of prayer that's specifically to bless us on atonement as well. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name. We worship you this day. This day that you have set apart as the queen of the Sabbath, this day that you have set apart as the most solemn and holy day of the year, this day that foreshadows the day when the door to life will forever close. And it is your desire that just as you called all the antediluvian world to be in the ark, anyone who would come could, you are calling us today to be within when the door is shut. And I just pray that each and every one of us will be making that choice, choosing that as for us in our house, we will serve you. We ask for the blood covering of Yeshua's precious blood that was shed for us to cover and cleanse our life record. May there be nothing between us and you this day, Father. I pray that you'll bless our study time as we are going to look into the Maseroth and the two... um, constellation families that foretell the ultimate and the personal day of atonement and i just pray that you will help our understanding and may we walk in what we find praise you and we ask it in yeshua's holy name amen
Atonement Written in the Stars. Now, I know that we are familiar with the idea now that the primary constellations, which unfortunately have been paganized and repackaged as the zodiac, that they originally were intended to be aligned with the 12 tribes of Israel. And that the prophetic word that Jacob spoke, his deathbed prophecies over his sons and their tribes, given in Genesis chapter 49, gives us the shape of the tribal enzymes and correlates directly with those constellations. And that this is the, the 12 fold principles that we are being given of the kingdom of Yah. 12 is one of the most spiritually meaningful numbers in scripture. It's the number of faith. It's the number of the kingdom. It's the number of Yahweh's authority and rulership. And so the reason that there are 12 original star families, because each of these primary constellations have three deacons, is that the constellations bear the message of the restoration of Yahweh's kingdom. So as I'm sure you can imagine, there must be at least one constellation about atonement, right? And not only is there one, there are two. One of them pertains to personal atonement, and the other pertains to planet-wide. So we're going to look at both of these today. The one that has to do with the ultimate and final day of atonement, the one just before the second coming, is the Tala constellation, and it is the worthy lamb that was slain today, represented as a ram with horns, but this was not the ancient way of portraying this constellation. This is indeed a portrayal of Yeshua, and at the name of Yeshua, every knee will bow on this ultimate day of atonement, of things in heaven, of things in earth, and of things under the earth. So we'll be studying um, Tala and its uh, three deacons as we look for the lessons in the ultimate and final day of atonement. There is also, as I mentioned, a constellation that pertains to personal atonement, and that is Gedi. Today, it's called Capricornus, which is uh, wrong, but it's usually portrayed correctly even today, after all these years, being a goat fish. Now, as I've mentioned before, the heavens are divided into four quadrants, which are portraying the branch prophecies. We know that Yeshua is the Messiah because the Messiah was the one who would come and fulfill the branch prophecies. And so the branch portrayal of Messiah, man, eagle, bull, lion, these are the, these are the principles and the worthy lamb that was slain. There are five branch prophecies and they are the heart of the throne of Yahweh. That's why we have living creatures, the seraphim, who have the shapes, in fact, portraying man, eagle, bull, lion. And of course, you remember in Revelation, who's at the very heart, the worthy lamb that was slain. The heavens are divided into four quadrants, and these four quadrants divide the primary constellations, 12 of them, three per quadrant, and their deacons. And each quadrant shows another level, another aspect of the messianic work. And so the first quadrant is on the eagle quadrant. And this is where the experiencing of the mighty works of Yahweh happens. And this is spiritual deliverance and victory in the first quadrant. Now the atonement quadrants, the atonement constellations, excuse me, are not in the first quadrant and they're not in the fourth quadrant, which is the lion. They are in the second and third quadrants. The second quadrant is the man quadrant of the heavens, Messiah coming as man. The eagle, by the way, if I didn't mention it, has to do with his divine work. And so in the second quadrant, Yeshua is our living example, and we are given our calling in Messiah. And so it is in this quadrant that we find Gedi, the goat of personal atonement. It is a part of following the living example, accepting our calling and being able to follow Yeshua, being cleansed. The third quadrant is where we find the planet-wide 
atonement constellation being Tala. And this one has to do with sharing in his suffering and glory. This is the bull quadrant. And um, the uh, bull is the actual constellation that completes this quadrant. And the bull is the one that represents the second coming. Um, it's specifically the Re'im bull is a constellation that portrays the seven last plagues, the end time judgment against the wicked. And one of the deacons of the bull happens to be Orion. And that is the second coming constellation. So just before the mighty Re'im is a quiet little constellation that is one of the center points of the sky. And that is Tala. Tala, the worthy lamb that was slain. So let's look at these. We're going to begin with the constellations pertaining to personal atonement. <clears throat> Now, I know when I do a Maseroth talk, you're used to seeing me show you what's happening in the heavens right then. I am going to be showing that at the end. But there's something that I wanted to pause and do first. I wanted to show you how atonement is portrayed and the steps and aspects that are a part of it given in the Maseroth. And these are permanent things that are up there, uh, at least for now. <laughs> So Gedi, the goat fish of atonement, is the primary constellation, so-called, because the sun passes through visually these 12 primary constellations, okay? So Gedi is the primary, and we'll start with it. Oops, I didn't mean to double-click there. Let me go back. All right. Gedi, which is now called Capricornus, at first appears to be a very strange thing in the sky, right? We have not seen a creature like this on Earth. It is a goat with a fish tail, a sea goat. Now, in Bible prophecy, as well as in the sky picture, symbols are used to convey Yahweh's messages. And in this constellation, our Heavenly Father has a beautiful promise and message for his people. The ancient people portrayed this goat as dying, and the ones that I'm especially paying attention to are the architecture um, and the carvings of the stars done by Joseph and Moses when they were in Egypt, and they did portray those constellations. So we do know that the ancient patriarchs understood this to be a goat fish. And so it was a dying goat. Interesting. Now the goat is dying, representing the goat sacrificed for us at atonement. And of course, the sacrifice that atoned for our sins is the death of Messiah who paid for our sins on the cross. And of course, that's the message of the dying goat. And in contrast to the dying goat, there is a living fishtail. And the stars actually show that, the concept of transitioning from death into life. In the scriptures, fish represent those who are saved. They are baptized. They are born of water, John 3, 5. And so also, if you remember, when the disciples were called to go out as evangelists, they were called to be fishers of men. And the term fishermen uh, came after that, and it actually meant evangelist. If you read in the Bible, you'll see that before they were fishers of men, they were just fishers. And fishers caught fish. <laughs> But of course, a fisher of men, the symbol here is that those who are saved are to be born of water and to be fish, the, the fish who are caught. And so as we personally claim Messiah's atonement, we become living fish spiritually who are reconciled to Yahweh and are called to then be fishers of men. And this is Romans 5, verse 10 to 11. When we were enemies... We were reconciled to Yahweh by the death of his son. And not only so, but we also joy in Yahweh through our sovereign, Yahshua Messiah, by whom we have now received the atonement. And so that's a little bit on the screen there. And also the, the name for this constellation is found in Genesis 27, 9 for one of the sightings. Go now to the flock and fetch me two good kids Gedi of the goats. All right, now let's take a peek at the stars here in this constellation. And also I wanted to show you what you would see if you went out to look for Gedi in the night sky. 
Getty is the 40th largest constellation, so really it's one of the smaller of the 12 primary constellations. It just covers an area of 414 square degrees of the southern sky between latitudes 60, plus 60 degrees and minus 90 degrees. And the first star that we're going to look at is Al Getty, and I'm going to brighten it up there for you. And Al Getty, uh, all today called Delta Capricorn, is a multiple star system. It's actually the the brightest star in the constellation Getty, and the, and the name of it is from the name for the goat. Uh, the primary star is much bigger than our sun. Um, in fact, it has a 2.0 solar masses, or 200% of our sun's mass. And also, this particular star system, which visually forms one star, is a very fast spinner, having rotational velocity at around 105 kilometers, or 65.2 miles per second. And this rotation rate is synchronous to its orbital p period, and uh, quite an unusual feature, by the way, for a major star, since they don't usually spin so fast. Also, the primary star has a surface temperature that is uh, 1.2 times hotter than our sun, and it's very energetic. It's 8.5 times brighter than our sun. Um, the next of the uh, stars is Dabi. And Dabi, right there, is... Um, is also today it's called Beta Capricorni, and it's a complicated system actually made of five stars at least. There is a red giant or subgiant and a blue star, and there's also um, a companion that's uh, much smaller, and almost nothing is known about that one, but they're aware that it's there. And far away of these three is a pair of blue-white subgiants and a white star. So there's a lot going on in there. The next star is the one down in the fishtail that's highlighted there, Sa'ad al-Nashira, or today it's just called Nashira, or also it's called Gamma Capricorni, and it is a hypergiant. So you can see a little close-up of that one. Amazing things that Yahweh has created out there. Now, the goat ha has three deacons, deacon constellations, which we're going to take a look at. There is the wounded eagle, the springing up fish that has been renamed into a dolphin, and the arrow, which is a killing arrow, representing the message that is given by Yahweh's people, which is the arrow that is sharp in the heart of the king's enemies and ultimately brings down Babylon. Now, what you need to remember is that we had a bowman in the constellation just before this, and I didn't show it to you. It is on the overall picture here. So you can see uh, Sagittarius, as it's called today, is the divine archer. This is Kesheth, which literally means the bowman. And so Kesheth is shooting the arrow that you now see in the next sequence of the story. You now see it hanging or suspended in the sky. So we'll take a look at these things, and uh, we're going to begin with the eagle. Um, today they call this constellation Aquila but originally it was Nesher. Nesher is the first deacon of Gedi, and it shows a wounded eagle. Since ancient times, this constellation has been known to be an eagle, but how do we know it's wounded? Well, that detail is gained from the star names. In scripture and in the sky picture, the eagle is a symbol of Yahweh's deliverance and protection. And as we come under the blood banner, what happened when they put the Passover blood on the doorpost? Was there also protection being under the blood? And so that's the message here, that there is a wounding coming. There is a difficult time coming. But also the message is one of protection and deliverance. In fact, in Revelation, it talks about how um, Yahweh gives his bride wings of an eagle that she may go into the wilderness where she is nourished for a time and time. So the symbol is eagles. And in fact, in Exodus 19.4, Yahweh uh, likens the deliverance from Egypt to taking his people on nesher wings, eagles' wings. 
and bringing them unto himself. And I love it. We're going to be studying this at Sukkot, but uh, the fact is we are going to be experiencing a second exodus, a far bigger one than the first. In fact, he says it's so epic that the first exodus won't even come to mind anymore. So pale it will be in, by comparison to the second. So again, the eagle concept. And also it's mentioned in Jeremiah 49, 22, behold, he shall come up and fly as the eagle, Nesher, and spread his wings over Basra. Now Basra, oh my, we don't have time for that one. But I will tell you that when you start to study Basra, I believe it's the concentration camps. Basra is a station in well, we are going to study it during Sukkot, but um, Basra is one of the camp stations. And getting to that camp station is definitely a time of suffering, okay? And so when he talks about spreading his wings over Basra, it's a promise. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world, even in places like Basra. And so we do see here the symbol of Yahweh delivering his people with his mighty power. And so the sky picture of the wounded eagle is Yahweh's promise to protect and deliver his people in times of trouble. And it's also a warning that the walk with Messiah is not a trouble-free journey. Okay? Um, we should expect persecution if we are seeking the atonement of the blood of Messiah. John 16, 33, these things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. How do we have peace? atonement to be at peace with heaven in me that you might have peace and then what do you have if you have peace with him in the world you will have tribulation it goes on to say immediately but be of good cheer i have overcome the world and so it's very interesting that in john 16 33 the concept of atonement peace is joined with trouble and persecution the same happens in the sky the personal atonement constellation of Gedi is joined with the wounded eagle to demonstrate that when in me you have peace, in the world you also have suffering and persecution. And that's because he says, they hated me. The servant is not greater than his master, than his sovereign. So uh, peace within, but not peace without. But peace within. That's a very important thing to remember. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these stars. The first one I wanted to show you is the Altair. Altair star is, um, is an interesting star. It's located 17 light years from Earth. This star rotates very rapidly, 286 kilometers a second, which is why it has a strange shape. It's flattened at the poles. You can see it in comparison to the size of our sun. It's bigger. And you see its shape is more ellipso elliptical. And that's because of that very fast spin. Now, Altair is a very significant um, star for sky hopping. Sky hopping is the process of being able to recognize where the stars are in relationship to known stars. Okay? And so, have you ever looked for the southern, uh, excuse me, for the summer triangle? Have you looked for it? Usually in the summertime, it's almost straight up overhead in, in the night sky. And so anyway, the Altair star, I'm going to light it up for you down there. Altair is at the bottom of the Southern Triangle. And so that's part of the eagle. And once you find the Southern Triangle, you can spot the eagle. Now there are th two other constellations that are part of this Southern Triangle. And they are from the Swan which represents the cross in the northern hemisphere, the Tav, and uh, Denab from Cygnus, the swan, as it's called today. And then we have the harp of victory, Lyra, and the brightest star in it is Vega. And so Vega, Altair, and Denab form the summer triangle. And uh, you can use um, constellations you recognize to help you find it. We probably all know the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper. And uh, so you can see how they relate using the front of the Little Dipper coming forward on the, on the cup, it points right to Vega. And um, using the, uh, the middle handle of the Big Dipper, it points to Deneb, etc. And uh, you can also use the Scorpion, which is a very recognizable constellation. And uh, that will help you find the Southern 
um, summer triangle. I keep calling it southern. It's the summer triangle, and it will be just a bit up above the scorpion. Okay, so the next star we want to look at is, um, it's, it was Tara Red. Today it's called Tara Zed, and even it's called Gamina Aquilae. And it is a bright, giant star. Okay, this star is burning helium into carbon in its core. And after it has finished generating energy through nuclear fission, it's expected to become a white dwarf. And uh, anyway, the star has an estimated 3.5 times the mass of the sun and has expanded to 92 times our sun's radius. And it is radiating over 2100 times the luminosity of our sun. You know, when I read things like this, it just gives me a picture of Yahweh. Do you ever think Yahweh is going to experience something or you're going to experience something that he is not powerful enough to handle? If you're ever tempted to think that, I want you to remember the Bible says he breathes these out. He breathes out the stars. The heavens were formed by the breath of his mouth. Wow. <laughs> That is the one who you worship and who watches out over you. The next star is Alshane and or Alshayan, and it is now called Beta Aquila, and it is a subgiant star. I couldn't get a very close up shot of it, but I can show you a picture. And uh, because of its moderate brightness, Alshane should be easily visible from locations with dark skies. So you use a star hopping technique where once you figure out where the, um, the Altair star is, then you can see, begin to see the rest of the eagle. And you're going to have an asterism that, as you see in the lower left of the screen, looks a little bit like a kite, a squashed down kite. That's the shape of the brightest stars forming the eagle coming down. And the, the base of the kite, like the string coming down, is where his talons are. And then we have over here in the wing, al Okal or Okab, as they call it now. And it is a blue-white huge star that is 83 light years from Earth. And it is the third brightest star in, in uh, Nesher. Also, there are some beautiful deep space objects. And this one, Nesher is home to a number of planetary nebula, including NGC 6751. Now, planetary nebula can look simple, round, and planet-like in a small telescope, but when you see them with the Hubble telescope, you begin to get a glimmer of the things to enjoy in Sukkot. Because you know why the Feast of Sukkot is seven days? Because it's a trip. And the eighth day is the day for drinking of the water of life. It's not that you're going to be told, oh, don't touch the water of life. We haven't reached the eighth day. Nope, nope, nope. Can't have it yet. It's not that. It's that after the king comes on the first day of Sukkot, he's going to be taking us through to see these things with an immortal body. And, and no harm, just, just oh my Take the breath away. And I love to see the pictures and get a little, um, you know how if you're going to take a vacation, it's fun to look at the travel journals ahead, right? And imagine it. Well, think of this as you're looking at the travel journal <laughs> and imagine that moment with the creator. What a time it will be. Now, the, um, this is a Hubble image. And of, of, so this is a classic example of a planetary nebula and I should share with you that I think the creator intended for it to look like what you see. What do you see when you look at that? And here we are in the constellation that is referring to the eagle's wings spread out over Yahweh's people. And it goes right along with Psalms 33. Behold, the eye of Yahweh is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. And it's so big you can't miss it. <laughs> so big you can't miss it the next one is the very tiny little constellation of Shamem called Sagita today it is the arrow but it is a mighty arrow this is the arrow that brings down Babylon all the deceptions all the lies of Babylon and it brings down the abomination of desolation so this is the second deacon of Gedi the arrow Shamem and it in the prior star family, 
we I mentioned that there was Keshet, the mighty archer, riding forth. It's the the archer from Revelation chapter six. He rides the white horse and he comes bringing the crown of life. And so we see him in the sky. He is bringing the last gospel call to go out to the world. And um, this, and he also shoots the bow to show that Yahweh's people and, and Yahweh working brings a message. Shemem is meant to desolate, indicating it's a very effective destroying arrow. In fact, the word Shemem means desolate. And it's interesting because it's uh, in, in Daniel chapter seven, excuse me, chapter nine, where it talks about the 70 weeks, it says, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. We're talking abomination of desolation. And Yahweh has a way of making things suitable. The punishment fits the crime. They have established the abomination of desolation, and he will come with his message to desolate the desolation. And so in Matthew 23, 38, it says, your house is left unto you desolate, referring to the temple. That's this arrow. And in Hebrew, it would be this arrow's name. Of course, that's translated, although Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew would show you the other way. And from that time, the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up. Daniel 12, 11, Shemem, there shall be 1,290 days. And so this is a destroying arrow. In fact, in scripture, it says, thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. Psalms 45, verse five. And who are the king's enemies? We're talking the system of Babylon here, not people. We don't wrestle flesh and blood. But we are up against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. This arrow brings down Babylon. And Yahweh says in his word, thou art my battle axe and weapons of war and with thee will I destroy the nations. We're talking the image of Daniel 2. You know, so many times we Christians worry ourselves with the things that are coming. We're fearful. Oh, quake in our boots. And I get it. I've been there. Had to battle that. Have to probably have to battle it again soon. <laughs> it's hard. But you know what the truth is? Babylon should be quaking in its boots, not Yahweh's people, because he is going to use his people as the stone kingdom to smash Babylon. And so that's the concept in this arrow. This is what it might be small. It might look insignificant. It's a tiny little constellation, but it is so powerful because Yahweh is so powerful and never despise small beginnings. Then we have the third deacon, which is Dala. This one has been um, changed so that people today think of it as a dolphin, Delphinius, but it was never a dolphin in the old carvings of the stars. It was a fish. And dolphins don't have any significance spiritually. I mean, they're a beautiful animal. They're a lot of fun. They're not a clean animal, and they certainly don't represent the saved. Okay? So... The third deacon, Dala, now called Phineas, is, uh, is, is the last of Gedi's deacons. And it refers to something drawn out of the water, such as a fish drawn out by a fishing line. And actually, it was the Greeks that changed it to a dolphin. Um, but again, the old drawings show differently. And so, um, as we have seen already in our study of Gedi, fish represent converts to the kingdom of Yahweh. And so in the three deacons of Gedi, we see the results of accepting Messiah's atonement. When we accept Messiah's atonement, we ourselves become living fish. And we also become fishers of men who are sent out to catch souls for the kingdom. It says in uh, Psalms 30 verse 1, I will extol thee, O Yahweh, for thou hast lifted me up, raised me up, Dala, and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. And uh, in Numbers 24, 7, he shall pour the water out of his buckets and his seed shall be in many waters. Now, this is a very beautiful constellation with many beautiful things, even if it's a small one. It has um, an incredible cat's eye nebula, as it's called. 
and it also has the blue flash nebula and it has a globular cluster of stars um, at a distance of about 185,000 light years from us. And this globular cluster is NGC 7006. It's at the outer reaches of the galaxy. And what I think is so beautiful about it is that this globular cluster is shining as a reminder of how much fish. Because Abraham was told, number the stars, and if you can number the stars then you will be able to count your seed because your seed will be as the sand on the seashore and as the stars for numerate, for uh, numbering. And so here in a constellation representing those who are saved for the kingdom, this fish constellation, we have this beautiful star cluster as a reminder. Look how many. You can't even count the stars in that one cluster, let alone all the stars in the sky. But it certainly is a beautiful representation you don't have to worry that things will be wasted, that your efforts will be of naught, for naught. There will be many fish, much stars for the kingdom. Okay, now we've looked at the personal atonement constellation. Now, let's now turn our attention a little farther down the ecliptic path to just before the second coming constellation and come to Tala where we deal with the final day of atonement. And what does the sky tell us will happen on the final day of atonement? Very similar to scripture. So of course, we'll be going right along with scripture and the sky. Now, Tala is a very small, unassuming constellation and yet so mighty, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? And so it's very fitting that this constellation be quiet and unassuming and yet so pivotal that it's like the epicenter of the entire sky. If you look at Tala in the night sky, you almost look for a shepherd's crook instead of the whole sheep. The brightest stars move across the eyes of the sheep, so you can tell where the edge of its head is and where the eyes are going down to its back. That's what you see. So just so you get used to looking, when you look up in the sky, look for that shepherd's crook and you've got Tala. The rest of the stars are all there. It's just that they're not as bright. So the ones that make up the shepherd's uh, crook, um, if I can get my mouse to go over there. Well, anyway, um, they're, they're coming from the side of the face, two eyes, and down to the brightest star on the back. This constellation is called Aries today, but um, it was not a ram. It was a lamb. And again, it's one of the most powerful and unassuming of images in the sky, Tala. It's the eighth of the primary constellations. And here Messiah is depicted as the conqueror having gained victory over the dragon. So when this constellation happens, Calvary is over. Calvary was foretold in the second star family, which is the scales. Weighed in the balances found wanting, and yet the price of redemption is paid. Thank you. This is, not the, this is not the sacrifice constellation. This is the moment in time. This particular star uh, family is telling the moment in time when at the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, every knee will bow, Philippians 2.10, of things in heaven, of things in earth, and of things under the earth. In Revelation 5.12, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Now to demonstrate that this is a lamb and not a ram, I will show you one of the ancient carvings of this particular constellation. So here you see Tala um, in the picture. And um, so can you see it over there? Is my Laser pointer working? Okay. Um, oh, hey, now maybe. Yeah, okay. So Tala, Tala's right here. And um, you see he doesn't have horns? Uh -huh. <laughs> right. So the oldest representations of this constellation, he does not have horns. Um, now, let's look at some of the stars in this constellation. So 
Tala is a mid-sized constellation, by the way. It's about 441 square degrees. It has several stars with sizable planets. For example, Al-Hamal, which is one of the uh, bright stars, has an orbiting planet with a mass greater than Jupiter. And Al-Hamal is an orange giant. And then we have um, the star Al-Sheratan, or Beta Aretes, as it's called, and it's a blue-white star, which is 59 light years away from the Earth. And uh, so we're going to pull these up and go through these stars. The first one here in the eye, Al Sheraton. Okay, the next one out here to the side of the head actually is a binary star. So it's two stars spinning about each other that look like one star. Then over here in the other eye, we have a very large yellow um, supergiant with Al Hamal. And it has a very small... Um, blue white star that is with it and they together make one star appearance. Another fun thing about this constellation is that it has an unbarred spiral galaxy which is about 130 million light years away and uh, it's about 200,000 light years in diameter. <laughs> that means that if you could travel at the speed of light it would take you 200,000 years to cross this. <laughs> so it is twice the size of the Milky Way galaxy. And I think it's so incredible because here it is at the constellation that is inviting us into the future beyond the persecution. You see, um, this constellation, Tala, is when the persecution ends. The kingdom of Babylon is broken. And it is the final day of atonement. Those are blessings of atonement. The final one. There are three deacons that go with the lamb. We have the mighty warrior, who is a representation of Messiah himself. He's got the head of the snake king. <laughs> and who does that sound like? <laughs> well, it sounds like David and Goliath. That was a bit of a shadow picture of that. And um, this, this head of the, the giant, we'll talk about that. But this is a representation of Messiah having slain the enemy, having taken down the enemy. Then we have the sea monster, which is a combination of a dragon fish. And I talked about this constellation at Trumpets. And it has the two fish, which represent Philadelphia and Smyrna. Please refer to the Trumpets uh, talk for that detail. Bound by the tail, uh, bound by, the, by a band, representing the persecution and they are tied to this terrible sea monster that's one of the deacons the sea monster is one of the deacons of the worthy lamb and then there is the woman who we saw in the two fish constellation we saw her bound in chains and in great suffering and here she's sitting on a throne so we're going to look at these three deacons let's start out with the mighty warrior uh, they call it perseus today but it was Paratz. And so it's the first deacon of Tala. And Paratz is a representation of Christ who will break the power of the enemy, bringing Satan's terrible reign to an end. Yeshua Messiah is given the title of the breaker, both in scripture and in the sky. And so in the sky picture of Paratz, now they call it Perseus, Messiah is the breaker who comes to break Babylon and its system bring it down. It is done. And there is a beautiful pronouncement given in scripture. Now the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdom of Yahweh forevermore. This is the prophecy of Paratz in scripture. It's Micah 2 verse 12 to 13. And you'll find the name of this constellation in these Verses, the breaker is how it's translated in English. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. Yahweh's not going to be missing any of his people. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel, even if in persecution they were driven to the ends of the earth, he will gather them. The breaker, Paratz, is come up before them as a leader, and their king shall pass before them and Yahweh on the head of them. This is a victory procession, dear ones, a victory procession. And so the message of this constellation is simple and encouraging. The enemy will not always be able to hurt, destroy, and ruin. In fact, his time is short. And every time in the night sky, Parat is shining. That's the message. 
His time is short. Yeshua will defeat him. Revelation 12, 12. Yeshua, who paid for our redemption with his blood, will one day put an end to Hasatan's tyrannical dominion. Good news, isn't it? Amen. No wonder atonement was something to be so looked forward to. The Greeks um, had several, uh, they, they had the idea of this Perseus with this Medusa demon goddess with serpents for hair is how they portrayed it. But actually the identity of this defeated giant, one who had been so mighty in power it seemed on earth, actually is the serpent from Eden, the devil himself. And so the Greeks weren't too far off in representing serpents being tied to this. But um, the severed head is of Satan and his kingdom. Not that the devil ultimately dies here. Um, his d ultimate destruction is shown in the, in the lion constellation. But his power is broken here. And so um, it's interesting that in the severed head of Hasatan... Satan, the Arabic name for the star in the forehead is Al Ghul. Uh, excuse me, the head was Al Ghul, and the star is Goliath or Goliath, as we would say it. Now, this is kind of interesting because you saw David and Goliath in the Bible, and you, this was very much a lot like this constellation. I, I'm pretty sure David would have known about this constellation because the patriarchs all knew about the heavens. And so when David killed Goliath by hitting him in the forehead with a stone, it was the very location of the Goliath or Goliath star. And that's interesting. And then afterwards, he cuts his head off. And here you see the young warrior with a sword in hand and the severed head. I mean, it really is quite a picture of what you saw in shadow picture there in the story of David and Goliath. And it is a picture showing that our mighty Messiah will conquer Satan in the end. Okay, now I wanted to show you that we had something interesting happen with this Goliath or Goliath star. Suggesting the devil's impending doom, two comets passed through Hasatan conjuncting with the Al Gol or Goliath, Goliath star. The paths of the two comets visually formed crosshairs through Al Gol. In 1996, the Hayakutaki comet passed through the head of Hasatan conjuncting with Al Gol as shown on that yellow line. And then, um, and uh, then the comet, uh, that comet, by the way, I should tell you, is on a, um, a 20,000 year circuit. So it was timed precisely. And then one solar year to the day later, Hale Bop passed through Al Gol as shown in the other dotted line. So that was very significant that we had those two comets, one year to the day forming the crosshairs and coming through. Amazing. And uh, what years? it was 1996 and 1997, same day. And we're talking 20,000 year circuit for um, that uh, Hayakutaki comet. <laughs> Hail Bop is more frequent. But that timing was uh, very interesting. And Yahweh is using the heavens as a great clock to foretell things and to keep the timing. So on the final day of atonement, there are a number of things that happen and they are foretold in the heavens as well as in the scriptures. The beast and his kingdom are broken. And we do see that in Parats. When the lamb, the worthy lamb that was slain is worshiped and every knee bows, the beast kingdom will be broken. Revelation 13, 2 and 5, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Boy, can you picture that day coming? Do we have that climate happening? And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying... Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given him to continue 40 and two months, which is the 1260 days. And then Revelation eleven fifteen, And the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying, 
the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of Yahweh and of Yeshua, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now in the statue in Daniel 2, the Babylon head is gold. And can a body live without the head? So as Babylon falls in the stars, it is being foretold by the head being removed. Babylon is taken down here. Now we also have the persecuting power here, Leviathan, as we would say this in English, Leviathan, perhaps more in Hebrew. I don't know exactly. I'm sure I'm slaughtering that. This is the next deacon of Tala. It's now called Cetus, the sea monster. And in the heavens, Satan is most often pictured as a serpent or a dragon. And Leviathan has dragon aspects. Do you see that? Even the old carvings always showed dragon aspects. But also notice there are fish characteristics on it. It is a sea monster. And what do you know about fish? Fish represent those who are supposedly belonging to Yahweh, right? It is the dragon fish. And if you remember at the Feast of Trumpets, when we were studying the two fish representing the two companies at the end of the world, those who will be translated without seeing death, rising up in the fish, going straight up in the heavens, those who are martyred and lie down in, in death first, those two companies of believers they are both bound by the tail to this terrible creature. And so this creature, which is a dragon and fish, is actually belonging to Satan. They claim to be Yahweh's, that's the fish aspects, but they really have the character qualities and belong to the dragon, the devil himself. And so the Bible calls them the synagogue of Satan. In Psalm 74, 14, we read, Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Interesting. Who's in the wilderness? Remember the woman with the eagle's wings? Destroyed by. Then Revelation 3, 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. This is exactly what you see going on in this star family. The woman is on a throne because Yahweh says to his bride that if you share in my sufferings, you will share in my glory. And this is the constellation where Yeshua is glorified. And that happens before the second coming. At the name of Yeshua, every knee would bow. What happens to the synagogue of Satan? They who had persecuted. They persecuted both companies. They caused the martyrdom of Smyrna. They are the persecutors of both companies of fish. That's why Leviathan has a cord binding to both tails of the fish. But at this constellation, in the final day of atonement, Yahweh says that the synagogue of Satan will be forced to bow before their feet. And so Leviathan is before the feet of the woman. The tapestry of the heavens is very important as well. Always pay attention to that. So as we've seen, this group of Christians truly belong to Satan, supposed followers of God. They proclaim themselves to be, when it says they say they are Jews, it means they say they are the chosen people. They say they are Israel. They say they are the saved, the covenant partakers with Abraham. They say that, but actually it's a lie and they are belonging to hell. And so we do see that. This is, from, uh, this is a picture taken from Starry Night Pro and this is how they render this sea monster. They call it Cetus. Now, Cetus is the most uh, prom is most prominent in the southern hemisphere from January to February. Um, it is not. It is. Um, it is visible all year round, um, but it is also visible in the northern hemisphere in the autumn time and the early winter. And if you want to know what to look for, you look for this asterism. Look for the shape of the V with the two circles to be the fish. And then look for the underneath the fish, underneath the V is going to be Cetus or um, Leviathan, as it was called in Hebrew.
Now we are told that unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And we recognize that's the work of atonement. But there is more to this prophecy of the 2,300 days ending, which we know it ends on atonement because atonement is when the sanctuary is cleansed, right? So we have the 2,300 day prophecy, but there's more to it than just the cleansing of some physical space. Sanctuary is Kodesh, a sacred place or thing. Holiness, sorry, holiness in, in lexicon, it's a most sacred holy thing, like the ark, the holy vessels. It is the masculine noun from Kadash, meaning to pronounce holy, reserved exclusively for Yahweh. And Yahweh says of his people, what? No, you're not that your body is the temple. In other words, the sanctuary is more than a building. It's also the people much more than a building. And at the end, the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. Well, cleansed is sadak, to be cleared, to be uh, in the right, to obtain just cause. Does a building need to have a, its cause justified? Does the building need to be, have it, its name cleared? Does the building need to be exonerated? Interesting. But the downtrodden people of Yahweh are going to be restored and vindicated from wrongs. Yahweh says in that day when he causes the synagogue of Satan to worship before the saints feet, that the whole world will know that he has loved them. That is that moment of vindication, cleansing of the name and exonerating. And so the cleansing of the sanctuary is also the exoneration of the downtrodden people of Yahweh, very hated. Now, who persecutes them? Well, the dragon persecutes them, according to Revelation 12, verse 13 to 14, says the dragon persecuted the woman. And then in Daniel 7, 25, we find that the little horn persecutes God's people. And he, the little horn, shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. That's persecution. The whore of Revelation persecutes the saints, persecutes them as well. Revelation 17, 6, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Yeshua. And the beast and those who receive his mark persecute God's people as well. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshiped his image, for they did what? Shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. So this whole company of the synagogue of Satan is professing righteousness. And in fact, the day will come when they will think they are doing a righteous act when they kill the people of Yah. So the exoneration day is the day when those who really did belong to Yahweh really do. The survivors being Philadelphia, Smyrna being martyred, but they have a crown waiting for them. Be faithful unto death and I will give thee, Yah says, a crown of life. So in scripture, not only is the pure woman used to symbolize God's people, the saved people, but fish are another symbol of the saved because we are baptized, we are born of water. As it says in John 3, 5, Yeshua answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of Yah. And so um, the concept of the fish is, is given in, in scripture as well as in the sky. And so this thing has fish qualities because it claims to be part of the partaking of the covenant of Yah. And Matthew 4, 19, again, fishers of men. And Jeremiah 16, 16, we were talking about Jeremiah today, about how he says he'll send for many fishers and they shall fish them. And just shortly after that, he's going to send hunters and they will hunt them even out of the holes in the earth. Now, as, as I've shown in the Maseroth series and more, uh, more in depth than I can do today, um, the, uh, the same shapes are used in the original constellation shape. Uh, so, for example, the constellation Delhi, which is called the water carrier, now called Aquarius, um, is the heavenly waterman who is Messiah pouring out a never-ending supply of living water. And one of the deacons of this primary constellation is the great fish, 
Pisces Austrinius, as it's called, drinking up the living water to show that nothing that heaven pours out will be wasted. And there is a promise. In fact, the name of this constellation is found in Numbers 24, 7. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, Delhi, and his seed shall be in many waters. That's the fish, many waters, lots of, lots of fish. And his king shall be higher than Agag, because the king of kings is on this righteous side, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Okay, so the pouring out of water, um, out of the bellies will flow rivers of living water, the Bible says, out of the scripture. And without Yahweh, we are spiritually likened to being in a dry and desolate, barren desert. Uh, Psalm 63, 1, but when we are spiritually alive and fully revived, we are represented by flourishing by rivers. Psalms 1, 1 to 3. And in Joel 2, 28 and 29, Yahweh promises to pour out his spirit upon all flesh, people bringing life to souls who were spiritually dry and dead. And that's the message of Delhi, which comes just before the atonement, uh, personal atonement one of Gedi. So Messiah is the source of the water. We have the fish. This is a beautiful promise. And uh, that's some of the backstory. Now, in Revelation, our Savior is portrayed as standing among seven candlesticks. And these seven candlesticks represent the divisions within the church, the body of Christ. There are groups, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. But while there are seven listed, Yahweh also states that he has odd against five of them, and five are removed. So that ultimately, the woman, the bride of Messiah, the faithful people of Yahweh, his church is divided into two groups which are Philadelphia and Smyrna, and only Philadelphia and Smyrna are without blemish from among the original seven. So the others can be saved only by converting into Philadelphia and Smyrna. The uh, synagogue of Satan is foretold to persecute both Philadelphia and Smyrna. Let's see it. Revelation 2, verse 8 to 11, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Can you picture that terrible sea monster when you read about them there? The sea monster in the sky is the synagogue of Satan in Revelation. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days be thou faithful unto what? Death. Death. And I will give thee a crown of life. And so the promise of a crown of life is given to the martyrs in Revelation 2, 8 to 11. That group is Smyrna. They are the fish of um, Dagim, Pisces, as it's called today, that are lying down in the heavens, having passed first through the grave before being saved. Oh, and I have something I have to tell you. Just a little quick note. I always used to really, really, really be concerned that I didn't want to be a martyr in the last days because I wanted to see the king come. I just wanted to see the king come. And I thought, if I'm a martyr, I won't get to see him come. And then one day, Yahweh showed me that everybody sees him come. Everybody sees him come. Every eye will see him. There's even a special resurrection for those that pierced him. But um, that's the bad guys. Most of the bad guys have to be living to see him come. But for the saints, it even says that we will not prevent them which sleep, that they will be caught up first. They're, nobody's going to miss the second coming. Nobody's going to miss it. So that was just so comforting to me. So both fish here get to see him come. Absolutely. Now, the second group of saints is the 144,000. And those are the ones that endure persecution, but aren't going to be killed. Won't be that for lack of trying, but they won't be killed. After the close of probation, when no more saints can be killed, the synagogue of Satan will be made to worship before the feet of the believers in Philadelphia. And that happens because the persecution is forever over. Revelation 3, 7 to 11, and to the angels, 
angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things, things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth, referring to the door of probation. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, the door to life, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Oh, dear ones, may that be our testimony. And here's the future for that group. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee because thou hast kept the word of my patience. And so right here in the star picture, the woman is sitting on a throne because she has shared in his suffering and now she is to share in his glory. And guess who's at her feet? The synagogue of Satan. It's that moment in time. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. We will, by his grace, share in his glory. And so we've seen these two fish. We've seen their connection with the synagogue of Satan, that the band represents the band of persecution. The one rising up is those who ultimately the synagogue of Satan will worship before their feet, the other being the martyrs. But there is a crown of life awaiting for them. And that terrible fish dragon it's a good picture really the synagogue of satan now interestingly enough during the persecution one of the deacons of the two fish is koshara today called andromeda it is the woman in chains it is the 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 epitome of suffering this constellation for humans we never will suffer on the magnitude that our precious savior suffered But for humans, it's the epitome of the suffering, and it represents that final time of trouble. And so it is connected with the, it is a deacon of the two fish. But right here, one star family away, the woman is not in chains anymore. No, no, not anymore. In fact, not ever more. Isn't that cool? (laughs) Revelation 2.10, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried and ye shall have tribulation 10 days. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Mm -hmm. And so there it is, the synagogue of Satan before the feet of the woman. Isaiah 10, 22, for though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall be saved in return. And Romans 9, 27, Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Not everyone who claims to be Israel, not everyone who claims to be partakers of the covenant are actually God's people. In fact, a huge company are going to kill the real people of Yah, or try. And so we see that that is who is being portrayed here. Now, here we have the breaker. And the breaker comes up because when the worthy lamb is slain, Babylon's reign is over. The image, the head is gone. The toes are smashed. The whole image comes down with the loss of the head and the smashing of the stone kingdom. Psalm 74, 14, thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. And Revelation 3, 9, behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So we know that there's going to be a whole lot of deception, but on that final day of atonement, the ultimate day of atonement, all deception is over. The kingdom of hell is broken. And we do know the deception will be tremendous because after all, the dragon has fish characteristics. And it says, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So very, very sobering and serious picture, this synagogue of Satan. And the saints are going to be tempted to join the synagogue of Satan. That temptation is already happening. Some of the believers are going to be switching sides to join the team that will ultimately be the persecutor and on the side of hell. 
And so they do it by making it appear righteous. That's how Satan tempts people. Synagogue, by the way, is an interesting word. Let's take a look at that. Synagogue is an assemblage of persons by analogy, a Christian church, a congregation. This is supposed to be the saved. Synagogue of Satan. And they are of Satan, not Yah. And the synagogue of Satan, who the Bible says will persecute the true people of Yahweh, there's a whole axis of evil powers. The dragon is one of the persecutors. The beast, the woman who rides the beast, the little horn. We read the scriptures about them. And so this is an alliance and indeed a religious alliance that will come together in the last days. And it is wholeheartedly targeting the bride of Christ. But Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And as you recall, cleansing has to do with vindication, exoneration. And so when the final day of atonement comes, that is the moment in time when God's people are exonerated and vindicated. And that is the moment when the synagogue of Satan is forced to come and worship before their feet. All of this foretold in this star picture. So let's look at the third and final of the deacons there, Yaffa. Yaffa, the beautiful woman, representing the bride of Christ. Today they call this constellation Cassiopeia, which is even amongst the pagans, the most beautiful of all women. And why is she so beautiful? Because she looks like her beloved. She looks like her king in character. The scriptures everywhere describe the church as engaged to Christ hereafter to be married to him as the bride. And in fact, two constellations away, two star families away, you pass through the bull, you get the second coming constellation. Guess what the next one is? It's the two at the marriage supper of the lamb. And so the bride is the lamb's wife. In the prior star family, she was shown as the woman in the chains of persecution. But now she's free. And here's the promise that you see between these two constellations. Romans 8, 13 to, four, to 18, excuse me. For if ye live through the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body. That's a little shadow picture of how you personally keep atonement with afflicting the soul. Mortify the deeds of the body. Ye shall what? Live. And it goes beyond just a simple day, doesn't it? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of Yah. And if children, then heirs, heirs of Yah, and joint heirs with Messiah. Now here's the kicker. Notice this. Because this is, the, and this is the constellation of Kashara, the woman in chains, contrasted with Yaffa, the woman enthroned. It says, If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. When does the church get glorified? With him. They share in his glory. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Remember that picture. If you feel like the woman in chains and in fact are there, remember the next step. It's only one star family away. Now the bride shares in the glory of her beloved. So when Messiah is glorified, so is she. In Yaffa, we see the bride of Christ seated in a throne and she is beautiful because she has his lovely character. The Bible says um, in Ezekiel sixteen fourteen, thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness, my beauty, which I had put upon thee. 
Christ is to present his bride as the glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but holy and without blemish, Ephesians 5, 27. Having shared in Messiah's suffering, Yaffa is now an enthroned queen, a picture of the saved people of Yahweh when they partake in his promised glory and foreseeing that glorious future, John the Revelator wrote in Revelation 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Yeshua and for the word of Yah, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark. And they lived and reigned with Messiah a thousand years and more. Notice also the wording in Scripture that, that they are to be overcomers getting victory over the beast and his image and his mark. Now, you don't use the word victory for easy street. Victory is a fight. It's a battle. It's hard. There could be bloodshed. Victory over the beast, his image, and his mark. And I have to I have to just speak to you dear ones and encourage myself with the same. It is so easy for us to want life to go on as it always has. This is human nature. We we want to don't rock the boat, you know, I'm comfortable. Right? But I have news for you dear ones. You live in the last days. Life today is different than it was 5 years ago, isn't it? Don't be waiting for it to change back because it's not going to, okay? We are in the end of time and what is going to happen is that as we press forward and the mark of the beast becomes more and more prominent, what is going to be happening is that you won't be able to function in society with money anymore. You won't be able to buy or sell. You're not going to be able to collect a paycheck. Not going to be able to go to the grocery store. Not be able to put gasoline in the car. Guys, we have to settle this in our minds. I have people who are, who are giving up and, and moving into the realm of the mark of the beast because they don't want to lose their jobs. Please read the scriptures. Does it say you're going to keep your job up to the second coming? No. Does it say you're going to have a steady paycheck? No. It does say you should trust Yahweh. That wonderful Elohim who sent manna for the children of Israel in the wilderness and provided for Elijah. He is looking out for his people. But you need to know and settle it in your soul. Your life is about to change. It's not going to look like it always has. It can't. But that's okay. Because you know who's got you. Right? Do you know who's got you? That's what atonement's all about. Is to know that you belong to your heavenly king. So the church is the queen in gold of Ophir who sits upon the right hand of Messiah. Psalms 45, 9, King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did sit the queen in the gold of Ophir. Now, in uh, Song of Solomon, twice the name of this constellation appears, and Song of Solomon is a prophetic book about the bride of Christ. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, Yaffa, and come away. And in Song of Solomon 4, verse 7, Thou art all fair, Yaffa, my love. There is no spot in thee, because the spot has been covered in the blood, and she is made clean and I bumped it let me fix that all right so what a glorious future right mm -hmm. now Cassiopeia as they call it today or uh, or um, yeah it's it's a W mm -hmm. Yaffa looks like a W. That's the asterism. So when you go out and you look for it, it's an easy constellation to sight. And I had to show you something amazing. Speaking of deep space objects, because they have such significance. Do you know what the deep space objects are in Yaffa? 
Here's the first, the heart nebula. It has that name, by the way. What do you think? Is that a good name for this nebula? Yeah. Heart nebula. It's the beauty of this iconic picture here is that it's, um, it's a mix of bright pink hydrogen gas with dark dust clouds. And so the glowing nebula gets its nickname from the familiar shape, but it's been called that for a long time. It is approximately 7,500 light years from Earth, the heart nebula. And this one is another nebula in Yaffa. You know what it's called? The soul nebula. This one is an open cluster of stars surrounded by a clouds of uh, dust and gas over 150 light years across. It's located 6,500 light years from Earth in the constellation Yaffa. And it's right near the heart nebula. Winds and ultraviolet light from these young stars here uh, are excavating a cavity in the cloud and parts of that cloud are more dense than the surroundings that are being eroded more slowly and that forms the giant towers or pillars of dust and gas that make this incredible picture. Yaffa. She is beautiful because his comeliness is upon her and fittingly she is Yaffa because he has all of her heart and soul. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5 is the Shema, the very heart of the Bible. And it is referenced in these beautiful nebula. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim is one Yah. Thou shalt love Yahweh thy God with what? All thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. So whenever you look up and see the W, I want you to imagine them. You can't see them with a the naked eye, but there they are. The heart nebula and the soul nebula. Beautiful. I need to move fast. So I want to remind you the, that the job of the woman is to do the work of bringing that penetrating arrow that brings down Babylon. Thou sawest that a stone was cut out without hands for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. And this is a symbol of the stone coming out of Mount Zion. And it is the stone that smashes the kingdoms and brings them down. That pagan system that has blasphemously stood against the true king of kings. Jeremiah 51 20, thou art my battle axe, Yahweh says to his people. This is where the idea of a woman, the bride being the battle axe comes from <laughs> and weapons of war. With thee will I break in pieces the nations and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. Scripture tells us that there is a blessing waiting and this is the blessing of Yaffa. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand and three hundred and five and thirty days but go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. We're just going to look at a tiny piece of this, the concept of the blessing. This blessing is emphatic. It is epic. It is esher, and it means happiness, blessed, happy with an interjection, an exclamation point. In other words, super happy. And what makes the woman super happy to have in her hands that which she has striven for and waited for and waiting is to wait long, tarry, chaka. That which she has waited for is in her hands. And when you come to, you arrive at, you touch, it's in your hands that which you have longed for, hoped for, had faith to believe would come. We're talking about touching the promise of everlasting life. The finish line, guys, is not the second coming. The finish line is the final day of atonement. The second coming is the prize. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 64, 4, For since the beginning of the world men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O Elohim, besides thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. The waiting is bringing the blessing, the blessing that is so great. Isaiah 40, 31, but they that wait upon Yahweh shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as the eagles. We see this in Nesher, today called Aquila. Eagle's wings is not just protection. It's also a reference to this Isaiah prophecy to mount up with wings like eagles, to run and not be weary and walk and not faint. And we sing, teach me Yah, teach me Yah to wait. 
wait faithfully, wait patiently with every breath faithful because I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which Yahweh hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, and we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Revelation 2, 7, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of Yah. I hope and pray. And I know you do too, that each and every one of us will get that invitation. Come and eat, enter thou into the joy of thy master. And may none of us do what Cain did to sell our soul, to sell that eternal plan for a pot of lentils to save our paycheck today, to save our ability to provide for our temporal needs today. Esau, did I say? What did I say? Oh, thank you for helping me. It was Esau. And you know what Esau gave up? Do you know that there are 24 elders? They are the 12 apostles and the 12 sons of Jacob. They're not the sons of Esau. They're the sons of Jacob. What did Esau give up for those lentils? Just know we're all going to face the test of Esau. We are. In fact, it's coming to a neighborhood near you right now. Remember that pot of lentils. Go hungry. <laughs> Go hungry. <laughs> there are benefits to fasting. <laughs> Revelation 22, 1 and 2. And he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of Yahweh and of the lamb. And in the midst of the street of it on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees or tree were for the healing of the nations. Yes. When it says blessed is he that comes, it's talking how happy Wonderful praise Yahweh in your hands, that which you have fought for, waited for, known would come. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. The experience of the woman enthroned embodies the joy of the people of Yahweh on the day when the worthy lamb that was slain is exonerated. On the day when the kingdom of Babylon breaks, And that will happen on the final Day of Atonement. In the meantime, we need to experience the personal Day of Atonement. And that's the message of Gedi. To be accepting the precious sacrifice of Yeshua HaMashiach who took our goatishness upon himself that we can be a part of the living fish. And again, these two constellations and their messages are part of the two of the quadrants in the heavens. Messiah, our calling in him, our living example of what it means to be the sons and daughters of Yahweh. That's where the personal atonement constellation is. And the idea of sharing in his suffering and glory in the third quadrant, fellowship with the lamb, that is where the ultimate day of atonement quadrant is. Personal atonement to, to experience the life change and to be a new creature in Messiah. To then come under the eagle's wings of his protection, being well aware that there will be suffering in the wounded eagle. The reminder that we are being called to give the message as part of our job of catching fish for the kingdom. A message, the Elijah message, if you will, the ultimate message that brings down Babylon at last. The arrow is sharp in the heart of the king's enemies and there will be much fruit from all the effort. So the atonement work is being taken to the world. Much fish. Remember that globular cluster in the fish? Lots of stars. Atonement. The work of atonement and now ultimately the worthy lamb is slain. And on the day of the final atonement, Yeshua will be worshipped by all. Of things in heaven, that's angelic unfallen beings. Of things in earth, that's all humanity. And of things under the earth, that's the demonic realm. Everyone will bow down and worship Yeshua on the day of his um, exoneration. On the day of his glorification. 
Tala foretells that. And in the deacons, we have Babylon going down. The head that is cut, it's severed. The kingdoms of our God are here. It is all his. The kingdoms of this world are over. And we have the synagogue of Satan uh, brought down and worshiping at the saints' feet and knowing that he has loved his people and his people are enthroned sharing his glory for they have shared his suffering. Now, very quickly, let's look at the prophetic clock. There are um, There is a key to knowing timing in Genesis 1.14. So we've looked at the two star families that talk about atonement. And now let's look at the things going on in the heavens. Genesis 1.14 says that the heavenly lights are for all time, including prophetic time. And that is for signs. That word signs means prophetic time. Now, when you see a sky event, it will involve heavenly players. And so very quickly, I need to go through that there were seven biblical parts of the solar system. And these were only um, considered since they could be seen with the naked eye. And so whenever they're interacting over the backdrop of constellations, you have a sky event. And the message of the planets or the parts of the solar system is gained by getting the backdrop of the constellations that it's taking place over visually. So first we have the sun, which is the symbol of the heat or the hot one or the source of heat from ancient times. This has represented the heavenly father, and that's the reason Satan took it and turned it into sun worship. He wants to claim the worship that should belong to Yahweh. The moon is the symbol of the bride of Christ. She reflects his light. She reflects his loveliness in that her, his character is to be reflected in her. Then we have uh, Venus, which is Noga, anciently was the name. And it means the bright one, bright and morning star, which of course is a uh, representation of Messiah. And then we have Mars, which is anciently in Hebrew known as Ma'adim, um, being a harbinger of bloodshed. It means red, bloody, as in war. And then we have um, the, um, the uh, what did I do? Mercury, coca. I got coca, I called Mars, and this one is Mars. Coca means star. Sorry about that. And so Mars, Ma'adim, is red or bloody, and it's even a red planet. And then we come on to um, Sadek, Jupiter as it's called today, but Sadek means he who judges in righteousness, and it's referring to uh, Yahweh and in his righteous judgment role. And then we have the last but not least, Saturn, but Saturn um, is, it would seem the most paganized of all the planets, but it actually was the, one of the holiest being Sabbatai, was the Hebrew name, and it means the Sabbath day's planet. And it is the planet that foreshadows the seventh day rest as well as the Jubilee sabbatical rest. Okay, with that in mind, let's look at some of the sky messages. I'm going to start with, Pente with Atonement Weekend. It began Friday evening, October 15. And Friday evening, at, just after sunset, in the southeast, you would see Jupiter, Sadek, um, it was a palm's width to the upper right or eight degrees to the celestial northwest. Um, and there was of the bright gibbous wa waxing moon. And Saturn was visible off to the right. Um, and so basically the two were in the goat fish. They were in the personal atonement constellation. And so we have Sadek being in the tail. We have Sabbatai being in the nostrils of the goat. Interesting placement because it has to do, the nostrils are a symbol for the spirit. In the breath of life was put into man. man. Man became a living soul. So the concept of soul and spirit is very closely associated with the symbology of the nostrils. And in Genesis 7, 6, 3, excuse me, Yahweh says, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty. Interesting. We have the Sabbath planet, which points to Sabbath day as well as Sabbath years. And it is the reminder at the breath point that the spirit will not always strive. We are coming to this ultimate sabbatical time, aren't we? And so the call to experience personal atonement is very strong in this placement. And then in Isaiah 55, 6 to 3, seek ye Yahweh while he may be found. Did you notice that the fish tail that Sadek, the judge, 
planet, that it is right at the end of the tale. Seek ye Yahweh while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let them return unto Yahweh and he will have mercy upon him and to God for he will abundantly pardon. So the call is that time is running out for personal atonement. Is that a true statement? Mm -hmm. Definitely so. And the spirit of Yah will not always strive because the ultimate Sabbath is coming. All right, next, today, last night, which would be the eve of today, we had an interesting sky event. After sunset on uh, October 16, you would have seen a, a conjunction, a joining together of the morning star planet with the heart of the scorpion. Interesting. So let's take a look at that. Um, here we have the position of Venus, as it's called, Noga, um, the morning star. And the heart of the scorpion, the scorpion constellation represents death, specifically eternal death. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? A scorpion stings, okay? This constellation represents the sting of eternal death. And so we have the, the um, planet representing the bright morning star, which represents truth-filled light. And Yeshua, who is the source of light and truth, comes to this constellation in symbology to say that you need to come away from the heart of the scorpion. And so it's right there at the scorpion's heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 to 10, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, Yahweh, search the heart. I try the reins and give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And so this is a very appropriate atonement conjunction. Joel 2, 12 to 13, Therefore also now saith Yahweh, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Is that what we do at atonement? Mm -hmm. Rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto Yahweh your Elohim, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And this is poorly translated in English, repenteth him of the evil. He can't do evil. It means he was going to do something that would be not very happy for you if you don't turn to him because sin is going to be destroyed. And so this is the call. Come away from the heart of the scorpion, which brings eternal death. Sin brings death. And the last one that I will show you today is pertaining to Sukkot in just a few days. On October 21, the beginning of Sukkot, do you know that there is a meteor shower that coincides typically with Sukkot? In more modern times, it has coincided with Sukkot. And it is, do you know, the Orion meteor shower called the Orion Orionids. And that's very significant because Sukkot is about the second coming and Orion is the second coming constellation. And so the Orionids meteor shower calls the attention to this constellation. Now, it's an annual shower. It comes, uh, it's produced by the Earth crossing through a cloud of small particles dropped by uh, Halley's Comet. And the shower runs from September 23 to November 27. But guess when it peaks? The most comets of all of its run this year will be October 21, that night. And I say night because you remember days begin at the nighttime in the evening at the sunset. So actually that would be Sukkot. Okay. It's the first day of tabernacles, the eve. Thursday night. Thursday night. So at that time, um, the sky overhead will be moving directly into the densest region of the particle field. And we should be expecting anywhere from 21 fast meteors per hour. The Orionids meteors can appear anywhere in the sky, but they radiate out from the radiant point is the club that Orion is holding in his hand, the club at the top of the club that he's using to hit the false lion. So let's just fill this in really quickly so you can see what Orion looked like. This is the ancient picture of Orion. See, he's got the club. He's holding a lion by the throat. And you say, wait a minute, isn't Yeshua the lion? Yes, but there's been an antichrist who pretended to be Messiah. 
And so in this constellation, the anti-Messiah is getting judged. <laughs> I like that, don't you? And so anyway, Orion is, um, is a beautiful constellation, which arguably is the most significant in the, in the sky of all, even though it's not one of the 12 primary constellations. The reason for that is, did you know that the ancient people, God's people, believed that God's throne was through Orion's belt? And Joseph, who was Imhotep in Egypt, actually built the first pyramid because the throne of God was four square and high and lifted up. That shape was built to honor Yahweh. And um, it was a, a representation of his throne. And so people would have to come to Saqqara to buy grain. And interestingly enough, there was a practice in those days that if you wanted to show that your God was greater than somebody else's God, then you would take the effigy of their God and you would line it up in front of your God. And you saw this in the Bible story with Dagon. And the Ark of the Covenant was placed in front of Dagon to show that Dagon was being defeated, right? But what happens? Dagon falls. Dagon falls and breaks ultimately. And so at Saqqara, you see the serpents lined up in front of the pyramid. And it's not pagan. It's to show that all of your false gods are defeated. And when they came there to buy grain, oh my, I don't even have time to get into this part of the story. But I will just tell you, when they came to buy grain, they learned about the true Elohim, Yahweh. And so the pyramid, interestingly enough, in Giza was uh, planned by Imhotep. He drew out the plan for Egypt, recreating constellations to scale with structures on the ground. And you can see that if you want to go on my blog called God's Amazing Star Secret blogspot.com. I do have a lot of blogs about that. So the ancient people knew that the pyramid was associated with, with the, this particular constellation and the great pyramids were the, were the belt of Orion and they were placed, other pyramids were placed in to form the stars of the Orion constellation on the ground to scale. Interestingly enough, um, if the ancient people were right, the throne of Yah would be through Orion's belt. Now today, some creation scientists have taken that to consider if there's scientific evidence for that. And do you know that Hubble did find that there was a mathematical center of the universe, but he didn't want to admit it. And he writes about it in his diary, calling it odious, and it must be avoided at all costs. Talk about science being unbiased. <laughs> no. <laughs> and so he did not want that to get out, but it did. And creation scientists have discovered that the mathematical center of the universe is, guess where? Right through Orion's belt interestingly enough. And there is an interesting video on it. It's uh, by Robert Gentry. You can watch it on YouTube. It's called The Center of the Universe and the Great White Throne. And anyway, years ago, um, Mark and I took our kids to uh, an IMAX movie theater at a museum. And they were showing, it wasn't that we were going to movies. It, the IMAX movie was uh, associated with a museum showing the heavens. And oh my, I just sat there with goosebumps as I watched the Hubble images flying into Orion's belt. And I was like, oh, do they even know what they're looking at? <laughs> they're getting a, a, a mini tour of where we're going to go. And I was so excited. And I wish they would just turn the person's voice off because they were just talking all this evolution nonsense. And I was like, oh, just be quiet. Let me look at the pictures. <laughs> Let me look at the footage. And so today I want to show you a video um, because this is a big deal. You know, Orion is highlighted at Sukkot. Why? Because the king is coming. This is the second coming constellation. And so when you see the shooting stars at Sukkot, I want you to realize that that's what they are all, up, all about. It's a rejoicing. It's a celebration. It calls attention to the king is coming. This is something to be rejoicing about. So I got a chance to go online and take a few images from that video and incorporate them into a video. And I made a little video that is about five minutes long, okay? Okay. And you're going to get to fly in there and see some of what I saw. And let's go and experience Orion together just a little bit, shall we? As we get very excited about the ultimate Sukkot. <laughs>
Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the work of atonement. You are inviting us to experience it personally in the message of Gedi, now while there is time. And you are making us aware of what to look forward to in the ultimate atonement and then beyond. Oh, Father, we look forward to the day. May we be faithful with every breath so that we can come away with you at Sukkot. Glory to your holy name. We ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen.